it really is an honor to be sort of back home with you all to talk about our newest paper, Breastfeeding and Postperinatal Infant Deaths in the United States. I have no disclosures. This is not, however, an official CDC talk, but it has been approved to be presented by me as co-author of our published papers. So hopefully today we will identify the association between breastfeeding and postperinatal infant mortality. We'll explain the opportunity for breastfeeding promotion, protection, and support in infant mortality reduction initiatives. And Dr. Sketzina mentioned at the outset that this is National Breastfeeding Month, and it's a wonderful time to be able to talk to you about our recent publication. Um, I'm sure that you have seen the various themes for this month from our U.S. Breastfeeding Committee and the World uh, Breastfeeding Week, Enabling Breastfeeding, Making a Difference for Working Parents. I was especially taken by August 15th through 21st, Telling Our Stories, Elevating Our Voices, our Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander Week, because that was just about the same time of the Maui fire. And I feel like it's our imperative to continue to elevate their voices um, and tell this story for them and provide support that we can. Okay, so first we're gonna start out by talking about breastfeeding, my favorite topic of all time. This is the map from CDC from 2019. It's the most recent map that's uh, published on the website. And what you can see here is we do have a lot of differences in breastfeeding rates across the country. In this particular map, the light color is low breastfeeding and the dark color is high breastfeeding. So you can see where Tennessee sits, where I am in Ohio now, where we sit kind of in that lower breastfeeding rate area compared to the Northwest and parts of the Northeast. In addition, uh, there are breastfeeding disparities. This data is updated for the 2020 National Immunization Survey data. And I just wanted to point out that at all um, intervals that are collected by the National Immunization Survey at birth, at six months, 12 months, exclusive at three months and six months, you can see the disparity between overall U.S. initiation and the various time periods that, and compared to the white babies in yellow and the black babies in purple, that there's a big disparity in all of those time periods. So we have a lot of work to do to try to eliminate those disparities. I want to thank Dr. Sketzina for starting me off on this slide for the Tennessee breastfeeding rates, updated now for the 2020 National Immunization Survey data. And she was nice enough to add in Virginia, as you, I understand, cover Virginia and North Carolina and some of Kentucky in your catchment area. But you can see here for Tennessee initiation for the 2020 cohort was 81.1%, whereas Virginia beat you just a little bit at 83.8% and so on through each of the time periods measured by the CDC National Immunization Survey. The purple bar indicates the uh, difference between the Tennessee rate and the U.S. overall, and the pink bar is highlighting the 2030 Healthy People 2020 goals. So we have a lot of work to be done to reach those goals. The other CDC information that is published bi-yearly now is the MPINC hospital survey. So where do babies start breastfeeding? Almost all of them are going to start in the hospital, and this survey looks at the maternity care practices to support breastfeeding in the hospital. The total score for Tennessee in the 2022 report was 72 compared to the national of 81. So again, just an area for improvement. So I'm hoping some of you out there will say, oh, I can, I can start working on that, or that's something I care about. I want to learn more about that. There's a new publication from United States Breastfeeding Committee for each state, and this is very interesting, and I would encourage you all to look at it for all the different states that you all take care of, but 
It does go over the breastfeeding rates that we discussed, but it also shares the largest disparity between the racial and ethnic groups. So you can see the 20.7% disparity seen in Tennessee compared to 16% nationally, and also the 22% formula supplementation at two days compared to 19% nationally. And then it also outlines our WIC progress. And this is this is fascinating to me. And in Ohio, we are particularly bad in this um, section of the report. But the uh, fully breastfeeding for WIC versus partially breastfeeding, and then maybe most importantly, that form fully formula fed rate, you can see for Tennessee WIC babies, 72% compared to 66% um, for the U.S. So opportunities for improvement abound. And then it also outlines the landscape of support for breastfeeding because we know this is a team effort, all hands on deck, right? So to be born at a baby-friendly facility does increase breastfeeding rates. And you can see 30% of those are available across the U.S., but only 15% um, in Tennessee. And we've talked about the MPINC score. We don't have paid family leave in Tennessee or the U.S., so we have work to do there. And I'm really proud of Tennessee for having some early childhood breastfeeding support uh, on, on deck. So this is one of my favorite new maps from CDC. I want to spend just a tiny bit of time on it. In fact, here you'll notice the dark is low breastfeeding uh, versus the other map was reversed. So you always have to look at the legend on that. But you can see where all the county data is, is located uh, here for the very dark breastfeeding rates and how some of this overlaps in your catchment area versus the Northwest where we have the highest breastfeeding rates. You'll notice the hash marks in California and Michigan. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So when I was talking to Dr. Sketzina about doing this talk, I was trying to find out, well, which counties actually do you all serve? And I found this map on, on the website, but I understand that there were even other counties that I wasn't finding on that map. So what I did was, according to um, the information given to me by Dr. Sketzina, I pulled out the county data, and I just find this really fascinating. So according to the counties that you all cover and the CDC interactive county map, you can see uh, the differences in breastfeeding rates in the different counties. So here, for instance, in Hancock County, small number of births at 129, the initiation rate is only 59.7%, whereas over in Washington County, more births, 24, 30 births per year, but we have 83% initiation. So even the very beginnings of life are different for our, our babies across uh, the area. Then when you look at Virginia, I, I found this also fascinating. Um, the, the National Immunization Survey data we showed you showed that Virginia was ahead of Tennessee overall as a state. But you can see the catchment area you all are serving have much lower breastfeeding rates. So even though they're small in number, um, we have uh, several counties in the 50s for initiation of breastfeeding and no one in the catchment area of Virginia in, in the 80% range. The North Carolina counties that you cover, interestingly, really high breastfeeding rates, even Watauga County at 94.1% um, initiation of breastfeeding. And then in Kentucky, this was um, a very... Um, kind of shocking to me and uh, just sort of screamed out, what can we do here? We've got to do something here. So Harlan County, 35.6% initiation of any breastfeeding and Letcher County, 44.2%. So I hope I'm inspiring some young person out there to really want to dig in and dig deep and go uh, figure out how we can change the narrative for these babies being born in some of these areas. But now I'm going to shift gears a little bit so we can talk about infant mortality because we're going to tie them together. 
I hope by the end of today. So infant mortality is defined as the death of a child before the first birthday. The infant mortality rate is defined as deaths per thousand live births, and it's an overall indicator of a nation's well-being. Now, the U.S., the infant mortality rate is higher than other high-income countries, and disparities exist by race and ethnicity. So blowing that little graph up so you can see the red arrow shows where the United States is. And you can see we have a lot of room for improvement if we want to be like Finland, Japan, Iceland. We are not where we want to be for the amount of health care that we can provide in the U.S. Why are we where we are globally? In 2018, 4 million deaths occurred within the first year of life globally. This is according to WHO. And it's been well known for years that in the developing world, breastfeeding plays a role in the reduction of infant mortality. This shows globally the time period from 1990 to 2020 and that really nice decrease in under five mortality in the red line and neonatal mortality, the yellow line, both for rates and for actual numbers of deaths. So definitely things are improving globally. And this um, helps to identify the different causes of death globally that are affected by breastfeeding. I just highlighted some of them when we try to put together biologically, how is breastfeeding uh, responsible for decreasing infant mortality? And you can see the, um, sorry. Okay, uh, lower respiratory infections, diarrheal disease, sepsis, neonatal infections are reduced with breastfeeding globally and thankfully so. So in the US, our actual rate according to 2020 is 5.8 deaths per thousand live births and the Healthy People 2030 goal is 5.0 deaths per thousand live births. The leading causes of death are congenital malformations, short gestation, low birth weight, maternal complications of pregnancy, sudden infant death syndrome, unintentional injuries. So when we look at a, another favorite CDC map for infant mortality rates, here we see the dark colors are the highest infant mortality rates and the light colors are the lowest infant mortality rates. So you can see Tennessee and Kentucky are not the, the very, very highest in infant mortality as compared to the Deep South, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and yes, Ohio, where I am. Now this this graph to me is so powerful and, and part of the inspiration to just fight this as hard as we can. Because you see, you start at 1915 all the way up to 2017, and the, the nice decrease in infant mortality, all races, white and black, we're all getting better. Every year we're getting better. But the black-white ratio, which is the gray sort of uh, line that's going up, is increasing, has increased to over 2.5. It might be slightly decreasing down to 2.2. That is not acceptable. And that is something that we really need to work on. Um, this is the most recent data from CDC by race and ethnicity. And you can see that the non-Hispanic black infant mortality rate is 10.6 compared to the non Hispanic white of 4.5. So again, over that two times increase in infant mortality for our black babies compared to our white babies. And then this was published also by CDC for the Delta and Appalachia regions, also on the right showing from 1995 to 2017, 2018, a decrease which is very good and I'm very happy about that as we all are, but can we still see the amount of increase compared to the rest of the United States for Appalachia where you all are and the Delta where I was in Memphis. Uh, so much work to be done um, in the Appalachia and Delta regions. 
And then when I looked at that Appalachia Delta region map and thought about overlaying that breastfeeding initiation county map, can you see the dark, dark areas and the breastfeeding initiation it could almost be the same map for the Appalachia and Delta regions. So there is there is something going on here there that they have got to be connected in some way. Um, the Tennessee infant mortality rate reported by CDC was 6.2 per thousand live births. And I was delighted to see on the Tennessee.gov site for infant mortality that number five, what can we do about it was to improve breastfeeding and baby friendly workplace policies. So go Tennessee, because not everyone has breastfeeding on the radar for improvement in infant mortality. Um, Dr. Sketsina told me this was not your only breastfeeding talk, so don't worry. <laughs> I'm just going to say a word about breastfeeding is the normative standard for infant feeding and nutrition. We know it's associated with a reduced risk of many diseases and infections, sudden infant death syndrome, necrotizing enterocolitis, most important for the talk today. And we think about reduced risk for infants with infant mortality, we know there's a 40% lower risk for breastfeeding over two months um, with infant mortality. And also in the developing countries, a 14-fold greater risk if there's been no breastfeeding. Necrotizing enterocolitis is lower with an exclusive human milk diet. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the paper that I think really set the stage for us in looking at breastfeeding and infant mortality by Drs. Chin and Rogan from 2004. So they looked at actually babies from a survey in 1988. It was a representative sample of live births and infant deaths. They oversampled black and low birth weight babies. And they just looked at post neonatal death. They excluded all deaths less than 28 days, as well as congenital anomalies and malignancies and did a case control study. They looked at the exposure of breastfeeding ever versus never. They uh, outlined the ages at the death for the cases, and most of them, as you can see, were under six months of age. And what they found was an adjusted odds ratio of 0 0.8, or a reduction of 20%, with the initiation of any breastfeeding. And this held for Black babies as well as non-Black babies. The causes of death they identified were SIDS, infection, injuries, and other with reduction in the odds ratio, but not all statistically significant. So this led to the story I want to tell you about my first foray into this um, urgent need to look at breastfeeding and infant mortality was when I was living in Memphis. And this is actually a photo of the community grave site in Memphis that used to be called Babyland because there were so many baby deaths that they were buried in a community grave site. And this particular news article was called Born to Die. We know Memphis is in that Delta region we talked about at, at that time in 2005 with low breastfeeding, high infant mortality, high poverty. And working with my epidemiologist at the health department, we noticed that as breastfeeding went up on the right hand side of this picture, you can see the blue triangle is our black babies. As their breastfeeding rate came up, the black infant mortality went down. And some of the numbers we've thrown out already today for the US 5.8 per thousand, you can see back in 2005, it was almost 20 black babies per thousand dying in Memphis. So just, just a terrible amount, but actually getting better at the same time breastfeeding was getting better. And this same time period, 2004 to 2014, where this just shows a timeline of various activities in the um, area to improve breastfeeding overlaid by the breastfeeding rate in the black population. What, this is one of the activities was a, sign, a billboard that we placed. And I just wanted to point this out because it was because of our uh, work with the infant mortality folks that we were able to put this billboard up.
and do a lot, a lot of other things with what we call not the usual suspects to promote breastfeeding. So what we looked at is this cohort from 2004 to 2014. And instead of a survey, we looked at the actual birth certificate data and linked the live birth certificates to infant death certificates. We decided to exclude less than 500 grams, less than seven days, also congenital anomalies and malignant neoplasms. And so our total live births were 148,679 and 598 deaths. And we did split them out neonatal, it's really the late neonatal after the seven days and the post neonatal deaths. And we looked at multiple characteristics for both mother and infant. And what we found was, oh, sorry, we did a, a logistic regression analysis for neonatal death and post-neonatal death. Our exposure was breastfeeding ever versus never, like Dr. Chen, and we adjusted for many confounders, possible confounders. These covariates could have been associated with both the exposure and the outcome, so they were adjusted in the logistic regression model. And our cohort had 59% self-reported as black, 37.4% self-reported as white, 68% in poverty by WIC or Medicaid as a proxy, um, over 60% unmarried, very little smoking during pregnancy, about a third uh, cesarean delivery, and about 10 to 12% considered preterm or low birth weight. Um, the breastfeeding of the cohort was 59.6% initiation overall, and then a big split, again, that disparity between white and back, black babies for initiation of the entire cohort, as well during in the overall infant death um, category as well. So what we found was, when even when controlling for those selective possible confounders was a 19% reduced risk with our odds ratio of 0 0.81. So very similar to Dr. Chen's findings. When we split out the late neonatal deaths from the post neonatal deaths, we found the biggest impact was in the late neonatal time period with 51% decrease compared to 5% at the post neonatal deaths. Our um, Causes of death that we looked at were infections, SIDS, injuries, and other. In our cohort, we did have statistical significance for the infection deaths. So this led to CDC saying, let's do this on a uh, United States basis. Let's, let's do what you have done in Memphis. Let's link the birth certificate data to the death data and look at the whole United States. And it was really the honor of my lifetime to be able to work with those folks. So starting in 2016, all 50 states and the District of Columbia did adopt the birth certificate that we had already used in Tennessee. So Tennessee was ahead of the game there, you see. Um, and the question that is on the birth certificate is in the, is the infant being breastfed at discharge? You have a yes or no option. And so we looked at the 2017 birth cohort across the nation, and we extended that to look out through the end of 2018. So we would look for any deaths occurring for a whole year after birth. Um, we had almost 4 million births and 22,000 deaths, but the exclusions we did in this study were similar to the Memphis study with less than 500 grams, deaths less than seven days, malignant neoplasm or congenital anomalies. And I mentioned California and Michigan. So they were excluded because they were not reporting or inconsistently reporting their breastfeeding data to CDC and the national um, statistics division. So when the exclusions were um, entered, we had 69, 69 post perinatal deaths, and we looked at the splits between late neonatal deaths and post neonatal deaths as well. The uh, main exposure was also breastfeeding at discharge. There is a nice description of what is required for this um, field in uh, CDC literature. And so um, they, what they have to do to come up with their yes or no response. It's really important for us to acknowledge that no exclusivity or duration was noted. 
on any of these studies. Um, the covariates from the birth certificate, we increased a little bit for this study. We included maternal diabetes and hypertension, um, timing of prenatal care uh, in, in this particular study. And the results showed the live births, what you might expect for the population of the United States with 20% Hispanic, 54% percent non-Hispanic white and 15 percent non-Hispanic black. We had most uh, mothers entering into prenatal care in the first trimester, most non-smokers, quite a bit of overweight and obesity, which we know is an issue, and about a third cesarean section, about 10 to 12 percent preterm and ICU or low birth weight. Now, this is a very big difference from the Memphis study and the Chen study, as well as that 83.6% breastfeeding initiation occurred for the entire cohort. And so you can see here um, by race, we have Hispanic, non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black. And I'd just like to point out the various breastfeeding percentages in um, parentheses. So we have the disparity that we've been talking about the whole time already, non-Hispanic white breastfeeding, 84.8%, non-Hispanic black, 72.2%, which persists throughout the infant deaths, and the infant deaths have a lower initiation overall as well. So something uh, is going on here with breastfeeding initiation and disparities and infant mortality. And so for the logistic regression analysis by total race and ethnicity, we have a 0.74 adjusted odds ratio for the total population of over 3 million babies. Um, and it held for all of our other, his, our, our other racial and ethnic groups. So you can see the Hispanic population 0.64, non-Hispanic white 0.75, non-Hispanic black 0.87. And the late neonatal, like the Memphis study, had a bigger effect size, so even lower odds ratios for the late neonatal deaths and a little bit higher for the post-neonatal deaths. And the causes of death in this cohort that were significant were for infection and sewage, sun, sudden unexpected infant death, um, unknown, and necrotizing intracolitis and other. So for this, this study, greater than 3 million infants born in 2017, 26% reduction in postperinatal death for initiation of any breastfeeding, 40% reduction in late neonatal, and 19% in postneonatal. So it, again, aligns with our previous U.S. studies, and it was much larger and more compelling. We did see the lowest effect size in the non-Hispanic black population, 17% versus 25%. But again, we're only including initiation of any breastfeeding. And so we know from our previous discussion of disparities that duration and exclusivity are lower in the non-Hispanic black population. And we also know that we are not capturing all the risk factors uh, on the birth certificate, such as the social and structural determinants of health and racism. But this led to the paper that I'll end with today that's newly published, The Associations Between Breastfeeding and Postperinatal Infant Death in the U.S., where we looked at three years cohort in the U.S. and we were able to report by region and by state in the hopes that it could help some of you in your states with infant mortality reduction initiatives to put breastfeeding as one of the many strategies that should be looked at. So again, we looked for 2016 to 2018, followed for one year after birth. We used similar exclusions, less than 500 grams, deaths less than seven days, malignant neoplasm, congenital anomalies. Exposure was the same, initiation of breastfeeding, and the outcome in this study, though, we looked at something a little different. We looked at the total postperinatal death from 7 to 364 days and the early postperinatal death in the first six months. Um, because remember, we talked about that is when we have the most of the infant deaths. So we decided to look at it that way in this study. We uh, looked at covariates, as you see here, age, education, race, ethnicity, WIC, um, and we 
did have to narrow our covariate grouping because of the massive amounts of data with 10 million babies to look at. So I just wanted to throw in a picture. This is still breast, Black Breastfeeding Week. The theme of this week is We Outside, celebrating connection in our communities. And I would imagine you have been to some events or are going to some events still for this week. It's been a really exciting time. So for this study, this is our consort diagram, which shows you where we started, when we excluded, and how we got down to those numbers of nearly 10 million live births and 20,000 and change infant deaths. Excuse me. Our live births were uh, similar to the previous study, similar to our U.S. makeup, 20% Hispanic, 55% non-Hispanic, Black, 15.5% non-Hispanic, I'm sorry, 55% non-Hispanic white and 15% non-Hispanic black. We had mostly non-smoking, about a third cesarean delivery, and a, about the same amount of preterm. And when we looked at the post-perinatal infant mortality for non-Hispanic black compared to non-Hispanic white, so those numbers look really small, don't they, compared to what we said the overall infant mortality rate is. This, I wanted to just point out, is related to all of those exclusions that we made in the beginning. We still see this over two times increase in our non-Hispanic white and our non-Hispanic black babies. So this is our table for the different characteristics that we looked at for the total group and the infant mortality rate. And I would love to spend the time to go through all of these with you, but of course we, we don't have that kind of time. But just if you wanna look at maternal characteristics of, of let's say age, less than 20 year olds, we're going to have a lower breastfeeding rate, 72.7% and a higher infant mortality, 3.87, as compared to our 30 to 34 year olds with 87.4% initiation and 1.53. Um, infant mortality rate. And we already mentioned the uh, the racial disparity there as well. So then we can drill down to the state and region. So of course, Tennessee is in the uh, Southeast region, uh, over 2 million births there and over 5,000 total postperinatal deaths. Tennessee had 250,000 almost live births and 766 Peri post perinatal deaths, the breastfeeding initiation 80.5, and the total post perinatal death rate 3.11, and the early infancy rate was 2.66. Now, this is the actual um, chart that shows all the states and all the regions, and and was developed by Dr. Chen for us. And this is so powerful to me to look at this. So when you, these are all the odds ratios for all the states and all the regions. And you can see where the dot is, is the adjusted odds ratio for all those covariates to try to rule out confounding. You can see that almost all the states have a dot on the left side, which is less than one which means we have a protective effect of our exposure of breastfeeding. Um, the confidence intervals are the line and a few of them do cross over one. And we have a couple that actually the odds ratio is right at one or a smidge over one. In most of those cases, it's related to having very few infant deaths or a very large, large confidence interval. And you can see it's fairly similar from the total postperinatal death to the early infant death, which does drive the total because most of those deaths do occur in the first um, six months. But I know that's really hard to show on a screen. So I tried to snip and pull some um, pictures out to look at it a little more carefully. This is just the regions. So when you divide up Mid-Atlantic, Midwest, Mountain Plains, Northeast, Southeast, Southwest, and Western. These are the Food and Nutrition Services designated regions for USDA. And that's, that's how we sorted the states for this study. And you can see Mid-Atlantic and Northeast both had an adjusted odds ratio of 0.56. So quite a big reduction 
and they have high breastfeeding rates as well, 82.3% for Mid-Atlantic and 87.2% for the Northeast. The Southeast was the lowest uh, reduction or the highest adjusted odds ratio, if you will, at 0 0.79 uh, and the lowest breastfeeding at 79.9%, but still well below one. So definitely protective and a really tight confidence interval there. And similarly for the early infant deaths, we had the, we had the same, uh, all the regions below one. So when we looked at the states, these are the actual numbers I thought you might find interesting instead of just the dots. Uh, Tennessee had the 766 deaths. The adjusted odds ratio was 0 0.79 for Tennessee and for the early infant death, 0 0.84. And to compare you to Virginia, um, just one of the states that you serve, that is 0 0.69 adjusted odds ratio and 0 0.70 for the um, early infant death. And we could also take a snapshot of the Southeast um, uh, our charts for you. And you can see here where Tennessee fits nicely below one. Um, and almost all the other states do as well, except South Carolina um, did not. And I that's something I wanna look into further. And for the mid-Atlantic, where Virginia lies, you can just see a, as a just a snapshot m more to the left and uh, more reduction in, in, in the infant mortality for the Midwest. And Southeast early infant death all below one, but closer to the one mark than um, the mid-Atlantic where we have Virginia. And so I, I just took the uh, catchment areas that you all have, which I'm still just kind of blown away by how many counties you cover, but your breastfeeding rates are, are listed there. So Virginia does have the highest breastfeeding rate, but remember when we looked at the counties you all cover, they have very low breastfeeding rates and Kentucky, the lowest breastfeeding rate there. But you, if you just look at the column on the right, the uh, adjusted odds ratio for everyone is way below one um, with Kentucky just crossing one for that confidence interval. So the summary for this uh, newest study is that for almost 10 million live births and 20,000 post perinatal deaths for 48 states and District of Columbia, the overall adjusted odds ratio was 0 0.67 or a 33% reduction in infant mortality with the initiation of any breastfeeding. And all seven US geographic regions had significant reductions with some variation. But we've got to do more research. We uh, have not included perinatal infant deaths in our study. This was in an attempt to reduce the possibility of reverse causality. If these babies were so sick, they never had the opportunity to have any breast milk. That we didn't include California and Michigan. And that we don't have any exclusivity, duration, or intensity of breastfeeding available when we're looking at these numbers. And as mentioned previously, the causal pathways may include racism and other social determinants that we cannot get from the birth certificate data. So when we look at a summary of the studies we've talked about today, starting from 1988 to the most current in 2016 to 2018, I think it's powerful to look at the breastfeeding percent of the total. And so, in Dr. Chen's study in 1988, that survey data had only 40% initiation of breastfeeding overall. In the Memphis study, only 59% initiation, but now in these later studies, 83% initiation. So we are improving overall our initiation of breastfeeding with the pockets of differences that we've highlighted uh, already today. And then the odds ratio in all of these studies are below one. Um, the, the only one that crosses one was our Memphis post perinatal, post neonatal infant death, um, where we had a 
odds ratio of 0 0.95 for post neonatal, but it did cross cross one for the confidence interval. But pretty powerful and repeated information and data on infant mortality as it's related to the initiation of any breastfeeding. So our implications are that breastfeeding saves lives. Breastfeeding promotion, protection, and support are key to infant mortality reduction initiatives. And I would like to posit that eliminating the disparities in breastfeeding may actually help us to reduce these disparities that are unacceptable in infant mortality. And we know that the Lancet series um, suggested that 823,000 lives of children less than five could be saved every year if we breastfeeding, if we scaled up breastfeeding to universal levels. These are my colleagues on these last two papers. And um, Jennifer Komet up there on the top was also our Shelby County epidemiologist for the Memphis study. And Dr. Chen's been involved in all of them. So he is my hero. And Dr. Uh, Lee is someone who who helps you get the breastfeeding data every year out for National Breastfeeding Month from that National Immunization Survey. She is definitely our um, data person at CDC. So I want to leave you with some thoughts about what you can do. Um, join infant mortality efforts in your state, in your region, in your localities. And my goodness, you guys can cover four states. Um, one, one thing is the FEMER, Fetal and Infant Mortality Review Committees. These are usually housed by the Departments of Health. They always are wanting people to help on their groups to review infant deaths and putting uh, breastfeeding on the table is a way to get engaged with the infant mortality reduction groups. Uh, Cradle Cincinnati is um, in my town of Cincinnati is a collective working on reduction of infant mortality. And it's really important, I think, for us, those of us in the breastfeeding world to be a part of other initiatives and bring them into our world as well so that we can all collaborate together. This is just to highlight again, that little butterfly logo there was our infant mortality reduction initiative in Memphis. At the time we invited a speaker to Memphis to talk about disparities and they came forward to us and said, how can we help you put up this billboard? And then it became a beautiful friendship and, uh, uh, partnership working together to reduce disparities in infant mortality and breastfeeding. And so getting involved with your public health departments is really important. And I just can't quite even imagine with all the counties you serve, which ones you'll be able to work with. But it's very exciting, um, the reach that you all could have, because public health does begin with breastfeeding. And since we're talking about initiation of breastfeeding, I just wanted to highlight something we did at Cincinnati Children's to focus on that population who may not have decided yet to breastfeed. Um, and certainly you all have some counties where this might be important. Um, this uh, is entitled Breastfeeding Saves Lives. And uh, you Welcome to scan that QR code and and share out these YouTube videos. Uh, they're very little short. One of them is a cute little infographic to kind of talk about breastfeeding looks different for everyone. What are the benefits of breastfeeding? How to make your village to support you with breastfeeding? And then I am so proud of Dr. Karen Scatsina joining uh, TIPQC now as the infant uh director. And I think I saw Brenda Barker's name on this call. So Brenda Barker, who runs the whole TIPQC initiative, um, it was an honor of my lifetime to be part of that. And I'm really glad uh, to have breastfeeding be involved with TIPQC and hope some of you can be involved with that as well as listening to those podcasts on breastfeeding. <laughs> 
And then I just want you to get like really psyched up about breastfeeding in general. It's uh, it made Times Square. So it must be really cool, right? It's there it is at Times Square. We have new laws protecting pregnant and lactating workers. We know sometimes the reason moms don't start breastfeeding is because they say, well, I have to go back to work so soon. And the Pump Act for Nursing Mother actually protects them everyone except airline pilots uh, and that they're working with them, uh, everyone, everyone uh, to have the right to express their milk on the job. And so I'd really love for all of you to get engaged with the United States Breastfeeding Committee. They have so many different opportunities to get engaged for a multitude of uh, promotional efforts, and I'd love you to join the AAP section on breastfeeding. And I would love for you to take a look at the new AAP breastfeeding curriculum that I had the opportunity to be a part of. It's uh, been updated and is very much more interactive. And as well to join the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine, which uh, is for all physicians and um, lots of important protocols for different conditions. And then I hope you're involved with your local and state breastfeeding coalitions because, because you can make a difference and, and save lives. And then, so let's say we start getting everybody breastfeeding. I want to end on this um, note. It's Don't worry, it's not a sad note. But we know this is CDC data from the recent immunization survey. Once they start breastfeeding, look how quickly it goes down. So uh, whenever, wherever they start, then they start to drop off. And it's our job to do all we can policy-wise, in the clinic, everywhere we go, to try to support them to continue breastfeeding and meeting the goals for our nation and for the AAP recommendations for six months of exclusive breastfeeding, exclusive breastfeeding and now two years continuation is recommended by the AAP. And I wanna fix this together. I want you to remember looking at this picture of Appalachia and Delta and the breastfeeding initiation of those dark areas. I think we can work on this, they're connected and we're in the right area and we can work on this together. And I wanted to just end with this, the World Breastfeeding Week from a few years back uh, had this infographic that breastfeeding is a universal solution that levels the playing field, giving everyone a fair start to life, whether it's preventing malnutrition, ensuring food security, even in times of crisis, and breaking the cycle of poverty. So it's the foundation of lifelong good health for both mothers and babies. And um, I think you, especially you youngsters out there, are the answer. And I'm very thankful that I got to talk to you today. And I will stop sharing and might have a moment for a question or two. I'm not sure.